Okay, um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome my co-conspirator in this operation. You know, this has been very much a, a joint operation. Um, professor Amy Marshall Colan, who's a professor in the Department of Plant Biology, um, plant molecular biologist who's also modeled metabolic pathways, uh, secondary metabolic pathways as well. Um, we've I realize there's probably some confusion because we called a project we had here plants in silico. Um, and we don't want to confuse that with the idea of a community effort around plants in silico. But this was something that was funded by the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment to allow a group of us modeling plants at different levels with different software, very different objectives to try and get together and see just how difficult is it to bring all these things together. And of course, we were aided by um, a team from and various people from the National Center for Supercomputer Applications who have a lot of experience in bringing teams together and producing positive results. So this is a large team that Amy will introduce. Many of them are present if you have questions about it afterwards. So Amy. Great, thank you, Steve. And again, I just wanna thank you all for being here and for your active participation in this symposium through these wonderful presentations that we've seen and the really stimulating discussions that we've already had and that we're looking forward to having more of uh, in our workshop this afternoon. And so uh, something that you've become aware of um, over these last couple of days is that plants in silico is really um, an interdisciplinary effort. And even here, just at Illinois, um, Plants in Silico um, involves researchers from four different departments across three colleges and three different institutes. Um, and so that's really the hallmark of Plants in Silico, is that it is um, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, and it's something that we hope to now include all of you in uh, into this vision of Plants in Silico. So really, the, uh, the brains and the hands and the keyboards uh, that are behind uh, putting uh, Plants in Silico together and making this a reality is this uh, really wonderful group of young researchers that you see here. And I hope that over the last couple of days, that you've been able to meet them and talk with them about their research, either over lunches or at their, at their posters. And so throughout this presentation, I'm going to be uh, very briefly highlighting uh, some of the work that they're doing and have been doing over the last, uh, last nine months um, to, to help us build this vision of uh, plants in silico. And so um, another thing that has become obvious over these last couple of days is that there are really uh, a large number of very robust models um, in the biology community um, from plant biologists as well as those working on other organisms. And what, what we've seen um, from these presentations uh, is that even a lot of these models are already doing a very good job of integrating different kinds of data. Um, so, for example, we, we've heard presentations uh, where um, individuals are incorporating uh, different data from the cellular level, the transcriptome, proteome, and metabolome. Um, but what I would argue is that we, we are still um, maybe lacking uh, this integration across biological domains. Um, and, and just to echo some of the things that Steve said on Thursday morning is that we feel that there is a need um, to move toward this type of modeling in order to achieve things and learn things that we couldn't with any single model on any single scale. And so some of the things that we hope to achieve um, by, by moving towards this multi-scale modeling platform is to be able to identify hidden parameters uh, that we're gonna be able to target for future study. But importantly is that this is going to, to provide a venue of, for synergy among uh, domain experts and then also by building this virtual plant, um, we would have the ability to perform thousands of simulations that would help us work towards building these crop um, idiotypes um, that, will be, that will help us understand um, how we can modify plants um, to overcome challenges of the future climate. 
And so uh, the last thing that's become obvious over the last couple of days is this is not an original thought. So there are many people in the mammalian and microbial worlds and even those in, in plant science who have been thinking about this multi-level modeling for quite some time. And we've heard some of those presentations here at this symposium. Um, in particular, it's the, the VPR project. Uh, that served as an inspiration for plants in silico. And we're thinking about ways now that we can incorporate some of the existing tools and research methodologies um, from these resources uh, to help make a similar reality in, in plants. And so I'm, I'm going to now give you some objectives of plants in silico. And, and I just want to clarify that these are, these are objectives that we've been thinking about here at Illinois, but this is not, um, it's not really defining plants in silico. That's what we're going to do together in our workshop this afternoon. Um, but as we got together as a smaller group uh, thinking about how to achieve this multi-level modeling, these are some of the things that, that we came up with and what we've been working towards. And the first is to localize these heterogeneous models, get them off of uh, individual researchers' laptops and into a realm um, where we can begin to integrate them. Uh, we realize that we also need to be able to uh, have a way of providing rapid data sharing among collaborators and then also be able to store these large models and data and manage them. Uh, plants in silico should also be capable of importing tools for model integration. And as you heard um, from Donna Cox's group and uh, Dr. P today, how important data visualization is and some of the things that we can achieve by including a higher level of uh, data visualization. And finally, we would like to be able to create a user-friendly web interface that is equally accessible to modelers as well as plant biologists. And so to, to help us achieve uh, these goals, uh, we already have support through many collaborators um, that are here on campus. So um, for example, we have collaborations with researchers in crop science, plant biology, chemical and biomolecular engineering. Um, we're working very closely with the National Data Service that Kenton McHenry talked about yesterday afternoon. Uh, we also have other collaborations with NCSA um, using, uh, we'll potentially be using their brown dog technologies. And then of course with the data visualization we have collaborations with those in computer science and the advanced visualization team at NCSA um, and again the National Data Service. And so then the more specific goals um, that we've set um, so far is, again, that we want to be able to construct this platform and centralize our models. Um, so, so really, ideally, uh, what we need is a virtual lab space that we can put in, in these models so that we can then run these experiments and then share that data with our collaborators. Uh, we need to be able to incorporate existing tools, maybe some of those from the VPR, uh, into the platform. And then, of course, uh, a major goal is actually integrating these models, getting them to talk together, and hopefully we can use some of those tools to do that. But independently, uh, or importantly, the idea is that we want these models to be modular so that they can run independently or they can be pieced together as an aggregate model. Of course, we want to, our, our goal is um, in the near future to be able to optimize and deploy um, like version one of the platform. And to make this open access as a community modeling platform. And um, again, that's something that we'd like to discuss with you uh, this afternoon in the workshop. So one of the first things uh, that we needed to do to begin achieving our goals was to begin building infrastructure that would be able to support a scalable platform. And so this is being achieved through our collaboration uh, with NCSA, in particular, the National Data Service. And again, Kenton talked about that a little bit yesterday afternoon. And so instead today, I want to highlight some of the work of David Rayla, who's a programmer uh, with NDS, um, who's been working with the individual researchers with their models and trying to figure out how to get them to talk together, talk to each other. And so one of the first challenges and a lot of us have talked about this um, when approaching model integration, is to identify those points of connection, but then also think about how we can use those points of connection for information exchange. And so the approach um, that David is using 
is called an advanced message queuing protocol. Uh, and so I'm just briefly going to walk through this, this diagram here, which is just an example of one of these AMQPs. Um, so we can think of our individual models as clients. And so they start off as being producer clients. And what they're producing is some sort of a message. And that message is getting sent to this message board. So think of it as these little post-it notes going to this message board. And the first thing that happens when the message board receives the message is that it's going to filter them and route them to the most appropriate queue. And so the messages are going to build up in these queues and will then be consumed by the consumer clients. The consumer clients will receive these messages. And after they process them, uh, they, in turn, will become one of these uh, producer clients, and the cycle can continue. So that's just this AMQP in a nutshell. But really, um, the most elegant thing about this system is that it allows for language-independent messaging. Another challenge that has been realized is that we can't have the expectation that existing models are all going to be written in the same langu language, and we also can't make the assumption that in independent research groups have the time or the resources to translate their models into a common language. And so, so this sort of system circumvents that um, using this, uh, this messaging system. Um, another aspect is that there's free communication um, without system-wide control. And what that means is that each one of these individual models can continue to run independently on their own time scales uh, while certain applications uh, within this protocol are going to continue checking these queues for new messages as inputs and outputs. And so once these new inputs and outputs are found, they can then be incorporated into the individual models to update their simulations. Uh, Kenton also mentioned this, but um, this protocol um, is is being run in Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, so this is a, a well-known and established application that allows us to browse our data sets, set up and run experiments, and then also perform the, um, the visualization of our integrated results. Um, also, um, this is a cloud-based uh, cloud platform. And again, the idea here is that we can have a centralized location uh, where these models can go um, and then be set up uh, in this protocol um, to inform each other. And David's right now working on this platform and creating um, a user-friendly interface. OK. And so the long-term goal um, for, for us uh, and, and for the community is then really to use this infrastructure to be able to link data among these models, um, ideally from the level of the molecule all the way up to the level of the ecosystem. But importantly, we also need to build in aspects um, where we can do this advanced visualization of the integrated data. So data that's coming from the individual models, but really how can we, how can we visualize this integrated data? What is that even going to look like? And so it's probably going to take uh, my whole career to get to that point. So I'm just going to show you where, where we are right now. And, and I think that what's been accomplished um, has already shown us that this is something that is within reach. Um, and the way that we're tackling this problem is, is piecewise. And so what our research team uh, has been doing is that we have members of the research team that are working to integrate these two levels. And Dee Walker talked about the molecular level, and my group's working at the, at the cellular level. We have a separate team that's working to integrate um, from uh, gene expression data to include uh, a metabolic model all the way up to the, to the whole plant or system level. And then we have um, our collaborators working on this advanced visualization. And at this point in time, um, they're just generating this pipeline to visualize some of the data from the, from the system level. And so this is where we're at right now. And I'll first, just very uh, briefly, I'm going to go through and talk about each one of these pieces. And so this is the first piece. And Dee Walker really told you about the molecular level modeling. And so I just really want to focus on, on uh, how, what we're thinking about doing to connect uh, the molecular level models to the cellular level models. And so this effort is uh, spearheaded by Balaji uh, Paneersilvam, who is a postdoc working with Dee Walker, and Stuti Srivastava, uh, who's a PhD student that's working in my lab. 
And so the goal of this integration is to take those uh, molecular dynamic simulations of uh, the protein NRT1.1 in its phosphorylated and unphosphorylated states, and then to take a gene regulatory network of changes in gene expression um, that it's responding to nitrogen over time, and then put those two pieces of information together, and the goal is that hopefully we can better explain or understand um, signaling, uh, nitrate signaling in plants. And so we know that signal transduction pathways are responding to external stimuli and internal environmental changes, and, and, this, and this is to maintain cellular homeostasis, and this often results in pretty significant changes at the transcriptional level. And so NRT1.1 is a unique protein in that it's one of these transceptor molecules, um, and it also um, has this dual nitrate uptake affinity. And so I stole this diagram from Alain Gojan, uh, who wrote this review back in 2011 about nitrate transceptors. Um, but I like this, this diagram uh, because it does a really good job of showing um, how post-translational modifications of a protein can directly result in changes at the transcriptional level. And here the example that's being shown is changes in mRNA levels of another nitrate transporter, uh, which is NRT2.1. And so, so a goal of this project is that we want to be able to mathematically model these kinds of relationships. And so the advantage of using uh, Balaji's molecular dynamic simulations is that they're able to provide us with new information about these transition dynamics among the three states of NRT1.1 that Dee Walker told you about in both the phosphorylated and the unphosphorylated forms. And so an output of these simulations um, is going to be the change in nitrate uptake rate as the protein moves um, through these different conformations. And so that will then also result in, a, in, a, in an estimate of endogenous nitrate concentrations. Um, however, these calculations are influenced, so this is our list of inputs and outputs, um, so, so his simulations are going to be influenced by exogenous nitrate concentration, temperature, and protein concentration. So the NRT1.1 gene regulatory network is uh, being built by Stuti, and she's using data from Gabrielle Crook's uh, 2010 genome biology paper. And in this model, she's also taking advantage of a, a predictive state space model that they had also developed. And what's great about this is that this model is able to predict the influence of various transcription factors on the uh, gene expression of NRT1.1 um, based solely on mRNA data. And so um, Stuti is using this model to develop two gene regulatory networks that describe the level of influence of these various transcription factors, which are shown here as the triangles, um, on the expression of NRT1.1, which is this little box at, at the top of the graph under both um, low and high nitrogen uh, conditions. And so comparing these two graphs, what we can see is, is how uh, NRT1.1 um, is influenced uh, by the various transcription factors. And so what you'll notice in these two graphs is that the connections are the same, but the level of influence, um, which is the thickness of these lines, is changing when we change from a low nitrogen state to a high nitrogen state. And so with this level of connectivity, uh, ultimately where we would like to go with these models is to be able to dynamically predict the change in NRT1.1 gene expression in response to, uh, uh, to for example, um, a genetic perturbation. And so, again, an input uh, of this model, something that this model would benefit from, uh, would be a, a, a better or more sophisticated estimation of endogenous nitrate concentrations, and so that's, so that's one thing that we could get from uh, Balaji's models. But an output of her model is that we can give them an estimate of NRT1.1 protein concentration. So the predicted change in NRT1.1 uh, mRNA levels can be converted into a predicted level of NRT1.1 protein concentration. And so this is a really common equation um, that is used to model translation. Um, but uh, 
we, we got some help from Zoe Rapti from the mathematics department here at the University of Illinois, who was working with my graduate students um, to build an optimization to help us solve for some of the unknown parameters that are in this equation that were beyond our capabilities. And so just briefly through this equation, um, P is the initial protein level, which we can make an educated guess about um, from other studies. D is that unknown feedback factor that we needed our optimization for. L is the, the translation rate or the protein synthesis rate. R is our measured mRNA concentrations. And U is a measure of protein degradation rate. And so uh, again, um, we were really fortunate um, to be able to take advantage of some existing data um, from this paper by Liet Al, uh, which came from Harvey Miller's lab, in which they had gone through and figured out um, the, the general protein synthesis and degradation rates for various um, gene families. And so we, we used those parameters um, in our model in order to predict NRT 1.1 protein level uh, based on NRT 1.1 mRNA levels. And, and so that's, this is the output so far. Um, that we have NRT 1.1 protein concentration at both high and low levels of nitrogen. And so again, this is one of those outputs of this model that can be used as an input in the, the protein level model. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears. So I've just been telling you about plant response to nitrogen, and we're now gonna talk about modeling plant response to carbon dioxide, and the data that's used in the, the next few models that I'll be talking about come from the soy phase facility here at the University of Illinois. All right, so the next model integration is also taking advantage of a gene regulatory network, but this time we're now incorporating that gene expression data into a metabolic model, which is of the dark reactions of photosynthesis. And so this effort is led by Kavya Kanan, who's also a, a PhD student in my lab, and Dr. Yu Wang, who is a postdoc in uh, Steve Long's lab. And so the goal of this model integration is that we want to be able to more accurately predict uh, how the enzymes involved in the dark reaction of photosynthesis are responding to elevated um, levels of carbon dioxide. So to do this, um, Kavya took some data um, from Andrew Leakey's 2009 PNAS paper um, of, uh, of how genes are responding to elevated levels of carbon dioxide. So again, this was done out at the soy phase facility. But this network only includes uh, the genes that are in that metabolic network. But what Kavya did in addition to that was also include um, putative transcriptional regulators of these genes. And so it's important for us to build these kinds of network models to get a better understanding of the relationships among these genes and how these relationships might change in response to some environmental perturbation. And we can also, just from these gene network models, um, get more information uh, about these genes at the level of transcription. So for example, uh, what we discovered from here is that this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase is one of the most highly connected genes in the network, and what it's connected to is a whole lot of transcription factors from different transcription factor families. And so our ultimate goal is to include this type of transcriptional regulation data um, in, in a dynamic model of crop response to carbon dioxide, but we're not there yet. We're at this stage where we just have the changes in gene expression and we built the network. And, and the, the point of integration right now is that we're just, again, taking advantage of these mRNA levels and trying to predict protein levels. And so, in fact, that's, uh, that's what Kavya did for 27 of the metabolic genes that are involved in these reactions. She pulled out those mRNA levels and used that same equation um, that I just walked you through in order to convert that mRNA into protein. And what we can see here is that um, these different um, genes and proteins are responding to carbon dioxide at different levels, and it goes from um, pretty significant um, response to almost no response whatsoever, uh, but we figured, what the heck, let's include all of the data and see if it made an incremental difference. And so these estimated protein levels were then incorporated into this metabolic um, photosynthesis model, and here this model in particular is really just of the, of the dark reactions. And so this is being constructed by Yu Wang, and what she has done is taken this metabolic model and made it capable of responding 
to various environmental signals, carbon dioxide, temperature, and light intensity. And so that's what's seen in these response curves over here on the right. Uh, the top curve is just showing model predicted uh, photosynthesis over um, carbon dioxide levels at four different temperatures. And the bottom is model predicted photosynthesis at different light intensities also at these four different temperatures. And so um, we included gene expression data for 27 out of the 39 uh, reactions that are being modeled. And I'm just highlighting here, um, these, are, these are the genes that had a really significant response to carbon dioxide. And although the majority of, of the genes that are in this network um, really didn't have a significant response to carbon dioxide, the inclusion of gene expression data did have a cumulative effect on the metabolic model output. And so what can be seen in this graph is the predicted um, photosynthesis rate under ambient and elevated uh, carbon dioxide conditions in the metabolic model alone, the metabolic model that includes um, estimates from the gene expression data, and then actual measured data from a 2005 study from the soy phase facility. And to the eye, <laughs> there might not look like there's a very big difference uh, among these different measurements, uh, but, but there is a small and significant difference. And that can best be seen by comparing the slope among these data points where the metabolic model alone, um, and so, sorry, here's slope is defined as the difference in photosynthesis rate divided by um, the difference in carbon dioxide concentrations. And so the slope um, between these for the metabolic model is 0.019. Uh, whereas by including gene expression data, it got bumped up to 0.024, which is quite a bit closer to um, the slope of the measured data, which is 0.025. Um, and so um, our idea here is that even these small and incremental changes at this, this scale will make a much larger difference when we scale up to the whole system level. And the last point um, that I want to make about this data before I move on to the next model integration um, is that we can also use these differences in prediction from the metabolic model, and I'll just call it the modified metabolic model, to help us maybe identify um, some genes that we can target for, for future engineering efforts. And so what is seen um, in this very simple heat map is, uh, is uh, protein content ratios. And so you had taken her metabolic model that didn't include our gene expression data, and she optimized it. Uh, the question was, what do the protein concentrations in the plant need to be in order to have the highest photosynthetic efficiency under elevated CO2 conditions? And that's the results that you see here. Um, so it's basically what direction do the protein concentrations need to go um, to reach our optimum? And so um, the column here on the left is uh, the metabolic model plus the gene expression data um, that's giving the same ratio, but this is, we can think of this as actual measure data based on the mRNA levels. And so this is giving us an idea of what, what those protein concentrations are in, in the plant right now at elevated CO2 concentrations. And so what we can see from this is where the current state of the plant is in agreement at least in the direction of the protein, uh, with the optimal um, measurements. And we can also see where it falls short. And so I would argue that these, uh, these genes might be our targets um, for some future engineering efforts. OK. Uh, and so then the next logical point of connection is to move um, from this metabolic model of the dark reactions to go on up to the system level. And so uh, this, again, involves uh, Yu Wang and her uh, metabolic model, but also Dr. Venkat Srinivasan, who's also a postdoc with Steve Long. So Venkat has been working on developing a whole plant model that scales from the leaf level all the way up to the canopy level. And, and this is called the plant grow model. And so we have our leaf level, level and our canopy level uh, models, but it also contains a separate model of um, soil and, and root uh, dynamics, and then also a phenology model. And so the idea of the plant grow model is to be able to um, couple these models, and we can think of that as coupling these horizontally, 
um, and then solve them iteratively in order to obtain this whole plant view um, and even a whole plant stand uh, representation of, of crop response to, to various um, environmental conditions. And so the inputs for this plant grow model include climate variables, and we've talked about those before, temperature, carbon dioxide, light intensity. Um, and some outputs of this model include energy mass fluxes and plant properties such as um, leaf area index and canopy height. So the modified metabolic model can supply new information to this plant grow model with reaction rates from both the dark and the light reactions. I just showed you the dark reactions. Um, but these parameters would be the VC max and J max. And likewise, this plant grow model is going to be able to provide new inputs into the metabolic model, including um, more accurate measures of light intensity, temperature, and endogenous carbon dioxide levels. And so we haven't gotten there yet, um, but this is next on our to-do list over the next couple of months is to integrate these two models. Okay. So up until now, I've been telling you about some of the approaches that our little team is, is using to achieve communication among these different um, biological scales. And I now want to take a step back and re-examine some of the goals of, uh, of plants in silico that I mentioned at the beginning. And we have to remember um, that our overarching goal is really to create a virtual plant that's an accurate representation of a living plant. And so to really achieve this, we have to include a realistic uh, geometry of the plant for our data visualization efforts. Um, another goal is that we want uh, the virtual plant to be an interactive piece of software that's accessible to, um, to biologists to use. And so um, to reach these goals, we can use Venkat's plant grow model as a springboard to explore what can we achieve when plant biologists talk with visualization experts. Um, and so this portion of the project is in collaboration uh, with the computer science department here at Illinois as well as the advanced visualization team at NCSA. And so uh, the people um, that are working on this, again, it's Venkat, but also Yuen Zhu and Apollo Ellis, who are graduate students with John Hart in computer science, and Kalina Borkowitz and AJ Christensen, who are programmers that are working with Donna Cox, uh, who talked with us yesterday afternoon. And so while the plant grow model already had a visualization aspect to it, it had several limitations. Um, so it's currently unable to provide a real-time simulation, and it's not really uh, able to interpolate unmeasured data. So it can represent um, just what's been measured. So Yi Wen, AJ, and Kalina basically rewrote this model in L system or the Lindenmeyer systems notation uh, that Dr. P uh, told you about um, pretty extensively. Um, but I'm just going to still go through this quick example um, to describe what this L systems modeling is able to do. And so this is just an example of branching. And so if we have a set of rules um, that's really just letters and brackets. Um, so F draws a line and brackets indicate a branch. And so these are our two sets of rules, right, where F turns into F bracket A, A turns into F. And so with every iteration, we can see that the code grows, and this is visualized as a branch. And what's amazing about this is that within just a few simple lines of code, we're already getting something that looks like a plant. And, and so these L systems are what's commonly used um, to, to um, describe plant architecture. And so that can be seen in this example of a plant, or it's, it's not running, but oh, there it is, uh, or this Mandelbrot sequence. And so why I wanted to show you this is, again, that just a few uh, simple lines of L systems code can turn, rapidly turn into a very complex visualization. So I'll move on before I make us sick. All right. Um, and so 
Uh, while the new visualization is based in L systems, Yi Wen wanted me to make sure that I told you that, that the rules that they built for this model are really go way beyond those simplistic examples that I gave you. And this is because they have to be able to account for the natural variability among leaves on a soybean plant. And so the advanced visualization rules uh, do take into account 18 types of parametric data that were collected um, for leaves that are on 16 different nodes of a soybean plant. And so some of these parameters are shown here, middle angle, right angle, left angle, and so on. Um, but these complex rules also include additional rules for plant growth and also randomness, which is how a, how a plant grows. Um, so another aspect of this new model language is that it enables the plant grow data to be read into visual effects software that can seamlessly move among data sets. And so the visual effects software Donna talked about yesterday afternoon, the one that they're using is called Houdini. And so this um, translation was necessary to be able to achieve that advanced visualization. And so implementation of these new rules and randomized branching patterns result in a much more realistic representation of a soybean leaf and thus a more realistic canopy structure, which is what we're hoping to achieve. And this can be best um, by, by comparing data from the old model, which is, uh, so this is a canopy growing over a growing season. Um, but these are still images um, because even though, like I said, there was a visualization aspect, it was really very slow and we couldn't observe this in real time. And so um, including these new rules, um, and you've seen this video a few times now, the visualization team was able to generate a soybean growth over a growing season uh, in real time. It's very sped up real time, but, but still it's in real time. And what's, what's really important to point out is that these modifications that were made by the visualization team really have a direct impact on the photosynthetic radiation that's calculated by the plant grow model. And so uh, that's, that's the next improvement of the plant grow model that I want to talk about briefly, um, is that this is another improvement that we were able to make with our collaboration with uh, computer science. So the original plant grow model took advantage of what was called unidirectional ray tracing. And uh, what you've learned by now is that ray tracing is uh, calculating the amount of light absorbed on a surface for a given amount of solar radiation. And this ray tracing is influenced by leaf angle and other um, aspects of the geometry. And so what Apollo Ellis did is that he's implementing a software called Embry um, that then took this model and took it towards bidirectional ray tracing. And this is important because that made um, this, this calculation of light absorption about 32 times faster than the original model. And this is a critical addition to the model because using diffuse light is necessary for accurate representation of light absorption, or, or so they tell me. Um, but, <laughs> but it's very computationally costly and slow. And so Embry has increased um, the speed of this process from, from two to five minutes per time step is what the original model was to really just a few seconds per time step. And so again, this is another uh, necessary addition um, to be able to realistically visualize uh, canopy light absorption. And so as before, this can um, most easily be seen by comparing results from the old model, which is again a series of these still images of um, light absorption in the canopy over a growing season. Um, but this movie is showing canopy light absorption over the course of a day. And again, this is a seamless transition and it's in real time. And it's, it's also taking advantage of that more realistic um, geometry from, from the L systems rules. All right, and the ultimate goal of these efforts, as we've been discussing, is to be able to make realistic observations in silico. And we really wanna be able to say how a single plant or a stand of plants change in response to a genetic or an environmental perturbation. And so these observed uh, changes to a canopy structure or light absorption 
can then cascade down to those other biological levels as we connect them together. And so this last movie, again, I think you've, you've seen this one, um, but what we can see in this final simulation are really the subtle changes in plant growth and final canopy height in soybean that's grown under ambient and elevated CO2 conditions. And what we're observing, again, in, in real time is that um, these plants are growing a little bit faster in elevated CO2. And so what you can imagine as a plant biologist, if you were to run this si a simulation, you're, you're making experimental observations as you're watching this happen. Okay. And, and so now um, we, we have this capability and we're able to describe, right now we're able to describe, but the goal is that we eventually want to be able to make predictions about the changes that are occurring at all of these different uh, biological levels within a plant under different environmental condi conditions. And right now um, we have the capability of, of doing that in the very near future for the cellular and the systems levels. Um, and so that's it for me. I again just want to thank all of the people here at Illinois um, who are involved in the leadership of this and then of course our young scientists who, who are doing the work and who are figuring out how to circumvent all of these challenges and there's a lot of challenges with this. Um, so, so thank you and if you have questions ask them. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Oh, there was somebody else. Oh, sorry. I've got a provoking question. Um, and it may be because I didn't understand your models. So the models that Prem showed are basically based on a mechanistic component, which is this, I would call it feed forward from auxin to increase the, con the accumulation of auxin into a cell. And that's a mechanistic. Whereas, it, unless I miss, I, maybe I misunderstood it, but your models are driven by algorithms which allow you to produce something, but do these algorithms have a mechanistic basis? Because if they don't, then the question is, how will you get predictions about the molecular components? If I can answer that. Yeah. The sort of the rendering one. That, so that is driven, that at present, that doesn't go down to the molecular basis. I think we've almost got that, though. So it, will, it, it goes down to the biochemical basis, though. So it's driven by the biochemical model, of, but only, only photosynthesis, then respiration is cruder, and so on. And then we're, basically, we've, we, we have a lot of field data on soybean and its relationship to dry matter production, leaf area production. So that's what is driving the differences that Amy showed at the end. But um, I mean, I think this really, your question just shows how valuable it would be if as a community we were working together because um, Chimak's way, way of doing this is, you know, we'd certainly say is far superior to what we're doing. And, you know, we do have data on hormonal controls. There are hormonal changes as well in this facility. So I think there'd be a real chance there to link that up and make this even more, you know, realistic and reflective of the underlying, reflecting the underlying mechanisms. So. Uh, thanks, Amy. So that was a, a great talk, great overview on uh, all of what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. Uh, I have one question, maybe it's overly detailed, but it's my area, so I'm just curious. Um, when you're linking the metabolic and the gene regulatory network models and putting those together, like what's the, uh, what's the framework or what's, how are you doing that or what, what's kind of driving that model? So at present, I should go over here. Um, at present, um, it's it's really minimal. It's it's kind of the bare bones linkage um, that we can make where we're we're converting those mRNA levels to protein levels, um, which is at like right now all that um, you can use in her in her model. So that's how we're linking them now. Um, our our big idea down the road is that 
we, we do want this to be a cyclic interaction where there's feedback uh, among the different models. And so it's important for us to have that gene regulatory network where we're including those transcription factors um, and trying to understand all of their putative target genes so that when we get feedback from this model of, okay, now there's been a change in carbon dioxide level, there's been a change in temperature, there's been a change in, in nitrate concentration, now what's happening at the level of transcription and then how does that propagate up to new measurements of, of protein? And so, so that's our long-term goal, but right now it's just at the very base. All right, great. So, yeah, Mark, sure. <laughs> but it's a detailed question, but you have this feedback, I think you call it D, from the protein level to basically the rate of translation. I didn't completely understand why this was necessary, because surely you could, I would have thought you could take that D out, because you could replace it by making the rate of degradation Mm. in some way dependent on the protein concentration. And that might even, I haven't thought this through, but this, there might even be a link there, especially over time, because as a protein gets older, it's more likely to get damaged, and you can probably assume that, with, that if you put a time dimension in, you might be able to remove or at least not be so necessary on this rather hypothetical feedback D, which I'm not aware of it being a general sort of molecular observation that there is a feedback from a protein to its own translation. There are in some specific cases. I was just wondering what was the motivation for putting this scheme together and not trying to play more with a KD. KD being what degradation. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to give you an overly honest answer, <laughs> is that when we were trying to think about how can we link up these models, we were like, okay, well, we need to model translation. And so myself and the graduate students, we searched the literature. How are people doing this? We know people are doing this. And we, we fell upon this equation. And Stuti and Kavya definitely correct me, but I think that you all found that having that D was necessary in order to um, see changes when you change the mRNA levels. Yeah. Was that correct? So when they removed D, or if D was infinitely small, um, they, they were changing the other parameters hugely, and it was making no difference in the final output. And so, so I'm not going to pretend to be an expert or even completely understand that equation, but I know that at least for us and our purposes of just this very low level um, model of translation, uh, this D was, was necessary. Um, for us. In, in a detailed way, I could, I could argue back that at least in, in plants, and in, in microbes it's slightly different because they're also growing quickly. And so uh, you have basically the growth, which itself is diluting out proteins. But in plants, the accumulating evidence is that the vast majority of the proteins have pretty slow turnovers. Mm. And that actually, I mean, this is work from our work. Willie Grissom has gone into, we were involved in as well as Willie Grissom's work. Uh, with Katja Berenfeller and others, that, uh, that you can have transcripts dance, dancing about in the framework of hours to sort of a, a dynal cycle, those sort of frameworks of hours, transcripts can be jumping up and down and the protein levels are actually are not changing. Right. They're not changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, basically the idea that we've come out with here is that uh, you can make a very simple thought experiment. Say you start off with a completely, say, naive cell, which has never made that protein. The transcript appears. The protein will accumulate, but providing you assume that the rate of degradation is in some way dependent on the concentration of the protein, then what you can predict is you'll rise up to some sort of steady state. And then you will only see the protein changing when the transcript changes if KD is actually pretty high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's the, we're thinking that in these sorts of more stable systems with longer cell cycle times, that the rate of protein degradation may be the key enabler of rapid responses. And the same thing happens once you hit a steady state. Right. So that's why I'm wondering, you may be trying to simulate something which you don't need for many proteins, for some sure, mm -hmm. but for some you don't. But 
Yeah, and, and I think yeah. you're right, and yeah. that was something that I was thinking about when I was listening to the last part of your talk where you all were measuring all of those synthesis and degradation rates. Oh. And, I, mean, I, yeah. I think putting another way around, we may have 2,000 transcription factors or putative annotated transcription factors in Arabidopsis, but we've also got, and compared to mammalian systems or yeast, we've got 40 E2 ligases and about 1,200 potential E3 ligases. Yeah. That means that when you start putting those things together in combinations, we've probably got more combinations than we need to degrade every single protein in different specific ways. And this has been a massive expansion in the plant genome. I think yeast and mammals have maybe got one E2 ligase and about 30 or 40 E3 three ligases. So this is a place where the plants have obviously massively expo expanded their potential. And if you think about the screens for light signaling, for hormone actions, most of those screens have landed on degradation of a protein not on a transcription factor. Yeah. So thinking about the pan, not actually hitting you with the pan. <laughs> yes, well, the easiest way to lead a dog a horse is by mouth. Uh -huh. So if I want to get rid of a protein, it's easier to take it into the stable with the head and push it. I think, but, and this is thinking, but I think we need to think much, much more about, I mean, if Richard Theostrov is here, he'd be pushing this a lot more, but mm -hmm. I think we need to think a lot about the regulation of protein degradation. Yeah, and one thing that would certainly help us is to have, have more data to help constrain our, our model and constrain our estimates. And so again, these are just estimates that we, that we have. Uh, thank you, Amy, that was uh, wonderful. And uh, this comment is not meant to be critical of, of you, but I just wanted to make the point, as a person who focuses on organisms, mm -hmm. that I think it's interesting that we have, you know, genes and molecules and all these different metabolism, and then we, when we come to organisms, we call them systems. Mm -hmm. But as somebody pointed out yesterday, what we really have is a system of systems. Every one of those levels of system. We saw the beautiful talk this morning on all the systems that go into just one protein, you know, folding and stuff. And I think because a lot of us are thinking about the molecular scale, so we have that in greater resolution in our minds. And we come to the scale that most of us don't work on, we just call it a system. But actually, an organism is composed of organs which have tissues, and each one of these scales has interesting biology. So I just wanted to make that terminological point mm -hmm. that instead of grouping all that into something called a system, I think really there's... there's Organismic so. biology, which, you know, tissue, organs, those are all separate scales, some of which are being modeled by people. So I just wanted to make that terminological point. Sure, and, and I really appreciate that comment because that's the sort of thing that, that we want to hear from you all is um, maybe where are some places that we got things right and some places that we really need to think a little bit deeper uh, about how we're defining, defining these, these different uh, biological domains. And so I think that's a really important point and that's become more and more apparent over these last couple of days. Okay, I'll make one comment and ask one question. Uh, the comment I want to make is, uh, uh, I guess, similar to what Jonathan was talking about. Is um, we have two, we have two issues here. One is simulating the machinery, the physical machinery, essentially how things are working biochemically. Mm -hmm. And then second thing is if we understand that, how this is regulated, mm -hmm. it might be very complex to put one model for everything. Oh, sure. Uh, if ever possible, that's actually my point, it's ever possible. Mm -hmm. But it's possible, seems to me, is uh, biochemically, a metabolic perspective, get things working. So we, as Jonathan was talking about, maybe uh, getting the layer of the metabolism model and about chemistry and the physics model working all the way from item to the ecosystem. That might be a first layer mm -hmm. of the goal. And then for each of the protein later, if it's of very big interest, we want working on developing a detailed regulatory module specific for that protein only. Because I'm sure for each one of them is a world. It's a world for its own, right? Mm -hmm. So this is my comment. Uh, the question I ask is um, uh, for your NRT one protein or one point one protein, and you get one 
uh, the reason I guess you want to focus on this one is uh, it's a key regulator, right? Mm -hmm. It's a protein. And my question is that also regulating just like a transcription factor? I'm just curious. Is regulation, is it like a regulation the other gene expression or regulation the other? Why that as a focal point? That's my question. Sorry, so are you asking that is NRT 1.1 regulated um, at this that level? And how it's regulating others? Um, right, and so so I think that is one of the questions that we can explore with this. Sure. And it's and I, I just very briefly mentioned it, and I think Dee Walker mentioned it too, is that what makes NRT 1.1 so interesting, it's not just um, a transporter that's pulling nitrate in, it's, it's also the very beginning of that signal transduction pathway. It's the receptor um, that is sending off the signals to tell the plant that here's, here's nitrate. Mark? You <laughs> if I can make a, a very quick comment on that, I mean, NRT11, it's also called Claw1, has been sitting there for at least 25 years as a obviously extremely important protein but where it wasn't important what clear why, because it was previously just a low affinity nitrate transporter. The reason why it's been sitting there as obviously an extremely important protein is that there were exhaustive screens run on chlorate. Chlorate is turned to nitrate, which the nitrate with chlorate is reduced by nitrate reductase to chloride, which is toxic. And this was used in fungi and bacteria to really uncover the components of the nitrogen signaling cascade. This was incredibly powerful screen in, in fungi. This was done ad nauseum in plants, and they basically only landed on knocking out nitrate reductase. There was only one other gene they landed on, and this was Claw1, this transporter. And nobody could understand for 25 years why this was the, oh, it is clearly said this is a crucial protein in nitrate signaling, because there's many other nitrate transport. This is not important there. This is an open question. It's now being solved, so it's a, this is a really good thing to target in on. Really good. Yeah. All right, let's thank Amy oh, and thanks. her team.